to welcome to the sixth talk of the webinar series on genetics and evolution organized by the journal of genetics the university sweden we are very happy that he readily agreed to speak at this webinar series professor swenson from the university working on he subsequently received a Fulbright grant to carry California and Santa Cruz. He was university in 2003 and has been professor there since 2008. Interested in evolutionary ecology, population biology, and phenotypic evolution, and currently studies ordinates primarily, although he has also studied several Research examines a wide range of issues, such as the interaction between natural and sexual selection, the evidence of genetic polymorphisms, speciation, and linking micro and macro evolution with sex differences. He is the recipient of the Swedish King's 50th Birthday Fund for Science, Technology, and Environment Award for research in the natural sciences from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. He is also an excellent photographer. His talk today is on bridging micro and macro evolution in an old. Thank you very much for, for that flattering uh, and nice introduction, Lydia. And thanks to you and Prasad for inviting me to this exciting event. I should first say I'm extremely honored uh, to be invited uh, to India because even though I've never been there professionally for a conference or anything, I feel very closely uh, connected to Indian science. And before I start my talk, I just want to show uh, two, two examples of this. Here in my office, I have this book, uh, this excellent biography about uh, Haldane, popularizing science by an, an Indian author. And Haldane, as many of you know, um, made a big uh, had a big influence on indian evolutionary biology i think he was even editor for the journal that's organizing so this book for those of you stu who are students you should read it and you learn a lot both about holding as a person uh, population genetics and evolution and holden's role in indian science so holden is clearly one of my scientific heroes i think we should avoid having scientific heroes but i make an exception for holden I also want to show another of my scientific heroes from India, and that is uh, Salim Ali, uh, the famous ornithologist. And this heavy volume I bought myself um, when I was a student traveling in India um, be, as a bird watcher in, in 1991 um, in a bookstore in Calcutta. Uh, an excellent bookstore, by the way. Um, I think I also bought Daniel Dennett's Darwin's Dangerous Idea in the same bookstore. Uh, so I feel very uh, uh, closely connected to Indian science. I follow with great interest the developments there, including the formation of your Indian Evolutionary Biology Society and also the Dragonfly Society, obviously. With that, uh, I will move on to my talk. Um, which will be the title is bridging micro and macro evolution in an old insect order and as Vidya said it will be uh, about a group of insects i worked on for now 20 years uh, namely odonates uh, dragonflies and damselflies as they are otherwise known and uh, to first uh, motivate uh, this and my choice of study organisms I would like to point to the fact that we have a series of model systems in evolutionary biology that are well known. Uh, you have encountered them all at various conferences and meetings. These are fantastic study systems. They include the Anolis lizards in the Caribbean, the Heliconus butterflies in, in South and Central America, the cichlids in the Great African Lakes, Darwin's finches on Galapagos Islands, guppies on Trinidad and Tobago, sticklebacks in post-glacial lakes, and of course the ever-present Drosophila melanogaster. These are amazing study systems. 
But you also know, will notice when you go to an evolutionary biology meeting anywhere, that uh, these, do these systems dominate uh, research to a very uh, great extent, and they shape our view of the world in both good and bad ways. In good ways, because they are clearly excellent model systems, in bad ways, to the same in the sense that they channel our thinking along certain lines and make us focus on certain problems and sometimes maybe forget that these model systems are sometimes have peculiarities which are not necessarily generalizable to other systems. So my general message here is a call for a greater diversity of model systems in evolutionary biology. And obviously, I'm biased in the sense that I think the group of insects I've been working on can uh, have an important role and can also contribute to bridge micro and micro, micro and macro evolution. And the insects I work on here are Odonata, also known as dragonflies and damselflies, two suborders. And you recognize them. Uh, the, Mainly, they mainly differ dragonflies being larger, having their wings spread out when they rest, whereas damselflies typically have their wings closed above the abdomen. And here are some photos from various species of dragonflies and damselflies that I've taken during field expeditions to various parts of the world in South America and uh, uh, Central, uh, South and Central Africa, and Sweden and Europe, of course. Uh, I have not. Uh, been so much to Asia, but I'd love to, especially going to uh, the Nilgiri hotspot in southern India, maybe one day in the post-COVID uh, future that will be possible. Uh, why do I then think and argue that Odonata is a good model system in evolutionary bi biology? There are several uh, features of them that make them excellent as model organisms, especially in the context of micro and macro evolution. And here are some of the reasons, and this is part uh, of the research coming from my uh, research group, but also others. So we have increasingly uh, availability of molecular phylogenies and molecular phylogenetic information that makes it possible using phylogenetic comparative methods to reconstruct uh, evolutionary history, ancestral state of various phenotypic characters, including body size and wing coloration, for instance, which are obviously very interesting traits. They, for being insects, and uh, they also have a very rich fossil history, uh, they, uh, with quite many fossils uh, preserved, which makes it possible to time calibrate phylogenies and also study the macroevolution of some traits, like particularly wing features. And the first problem I would like to address here, where we can incorporate both fossil information and data on extant living uh, odonates, is the evolution of body size and the problem of stasis. Uh, in the upper graph, you see uh, fossil data and, uh, and data on extant uh, dragonflies and damselflies uh, with confidence interval and the mean uh, over evolutionary time, over the last 300 million years. And as you can see, the odonates were much bigger about uh, 300 million years ago during the Carboniferous periods, and then main size decreased, and then they have remained largely the same size for the last 150, 200 million years. And in the lower graph, you see reconstructions of the atmospheric oxygen levels. And oxygen levels were actually above or around 30%, 300 million years, and then started dropping and they became very low, around 15%, uh, 200 million years, and then started increasing from 150 million years and onwards. So in general, body size evolution in Odonate seem to follow um, the atmospheric oxygen levels. The very big ones, now extinct, Meganura drag, uh, dragonfly-like, 
ancestors of modern dragonflies and damselflies had a wingspan about 75 centimeters. And they are thought to only have been able to reach that size uh, because of the high atmospheric oxygen level. Uh, because as many of you know, insects breathe, obtain oxygen through the tracheal system. And these large uh, flying insects needed these high oxygen level to, uh, to be able to uh, maintain this large body size. So go thus goes the story at least, and there is some truth to it, but as I will show here, it's not the entire truth. Also now in the upper graph, see a note that in the upper graph about 150 million years ago, birds evolved, uh, emerged on the scene as revealed by the first uh, fossil. Uh, Archaeopteryx, first bird-like fossil. If we go out in natural populations, as I've been doing uh, with my colleagues uh, over many years, uh, we can estimate natural and sexual selection on on, on individuals, on extant odonate taxa, uh, particularly species Calopteryx splendens. And in the upper graph, you show we see survivorship of males in relation to or wing length and total body length. Both are measures of size. They are quite cor uh, strongly correlated. And as you can see in terms of survivorship among adult males in the field, there is a positive relationship across year and also within years. So all else being in, uh, uh, equal, large individuals, they survive long, longer in the field as adults. In the lower graph, you see mating success of males uh, and uh, how mating success depends on wing length or total body length and there the picture is a little bit more com complicated but overall it seems to be some slight net advantage of being large uh, for for males also in terms of of size or at least no negative effect so overall it seems like large adult body size is favored in extant odonate taxa across years. Uh, there is a big benefit of being large and there appears to be no cost in terms of being large, at least in the adult stage. And to the right, you see a meta-analysis um, uh, or not formally a meta-analysis, but a literature compilation of how adult fitness components, including male and female survivorship in the field, male mating success, and female fecundity depends on body size. And the correlation coefficient is highly skewed or skewed towards the right. So there is a positive correlation uh, for most fitness components. Uh, as, uh, and there is no evidence that there is strong negative selection in the adult stage at any, in any population so far, in very few population. So overall, bigger is better for these insects, uh, at least during the adult stage. If we contrast this uh, selection in the adult stage against uh, the macroevolution of body size, the last uh, 240 million years, incorporating both extinct genera as fossils and extant genera, we see that overall body size as measured through wing length is remarkably stable. Uh, it, in fact, it hasn't changed, the average size of the ordinate uh, group as a whole hasn't changed. What has happened though, is that we have got, gotten larger and smaller ordinates as we approach the present, but the shift towards large and small size, size sizes are largely cancel each other out. So the average size of the clade remains stable. There is no trend or anything like a Cope's rule with ordinates becoming larger as we have seen in, in mammals, for instance. And, and, but you can also see the divergence, the diversification into specific divergence in wing length is also relatively constrained. Uh, you see the gray lines uh, the thin gray lines show the expectation from a Brownian motion model, a neutral uh, model of niche or, or diversification. And they are significantly constrained uh, 
uh, they are have evolved slower, uh, diversified slower in body size than expected from a neutral model. So we find support for a brown for an Ornstein Uhlenbeck model with constrained body size divergence. So di uh, diversity in body size increases, but it increases slowly. And to the right, you can see even more of this. There we have uh, 25 genera where we have an extant species, a representative, at least one extant representative, and at least one fossil representative. And then we have plotted over evolutionary time the average size of the extant and extinct uh, genera. And under a null hypothesis, positive shifts should be as common as negative shifts. Uh, and that is also what we find that the, some genera have increased, half genera have increased, half have decreased. And together they contribute to an overall pattern of stasis at the order level. So no trend towards larger odonates overall, in spite of actually oxygen level having increased slightly the last 150 million years. This time they didn't follow suit. So they are remarkably slow in terms of body size evolution. So why don't they become bigger then? We see there are adult fitness advantage of being large and apparently no, no apparent cost. We have argued that there is conflicting selection between selection benefits of being large as adults and the development time. So specifically to the left, you see the number of year as spent in the aquatic larval stage versus adult body length, and there is a positive relationship. This is for European species. So all else being equal, large uh, odonate species, this is corrected for phylo or incorporating phylogeny, uh, pay a cost in terms of long development time, many years as larvae. Uh, so we argue that there is conflict in selection between the benefits of being large and the cost of long development time, which probably exposes you to predators and increases your mortality risk. Although there is a positive relationship, you can also see there's a lot of scatter around it. So there might be ways to escape this predation or this cost of long development time by being exposed to predation, for instance, by developing burrowing behavior or invading uh, relatively novel predator-free environments. More about that later. Uh, so as I said, slow body size evolution stasis at the lineage level, but there are significant body size shift in extant lineages. So here you show it's around 1,000 species and a molecular phylogeny uh, that we have compiled. And here you can see uh, uh, some uh, in different colors, warm colors like red are significant uh, body size shift positive that they become larger than compared to close relatives uh, than, or the neutral expect background rate. And bluer colors are significant negative shifts, meaning that they have shifted downward in size more than, than the background rate. And there are several uh, significant shifts uh, which are interesting to, to um, understand. To the lower left corner, you see one such case, uh, and that is the famous helicopter damselflies of uh, Central and South America, which are the largest living extant member of damselflies now. And how did they, and why did they become so big? Well, we think that this might be a case of a predation, escape from predation during the larval stage, because these uh, large helicopter damselflies, they lay their eggs and the larva develop in tree holes in the rainforest. And presumably in these tree holes, uh, there is very little predation compared to streams, meaning that predation release enabled them to uh, grow towards a big size relatively fast without paying any predation cost. That hypothesis remains to be tested, though. Uh, 
looking globally uh, and at the distribution of body sizes uh, across the globe, comparing the temperate zone and the tropical zone, we find that to the left, if we look at, at uh, uh, sizes for the two suborders, damselflies and dragonflies, uh, without taking phylogeny into account, we find that damselflies are actually larger in the tropics, whereas dragonflies are, on the contrary, larger in the temperate zone. And combining the two suborders, the net effect is that both uh, the, the, the ordinata as a whole has larger size at higher latitudes. If we take phylogeny into account in the right graph, we see that the uh, uh, pattern of larger damselflies in the tropics disappears, and they actually become slightly larger, at least for hind wing length, in the temperate zone. And which is interesting because it suggests that it ind indicates that some large lineages in the tropics, some large damselfly lineages in the tropics, including the helicopter damselflies, uh, they are confounding the pattern, so to say, because those large lineages occur in the tropics and never dispersed up to the temperate zone. So this is an interesting case where, where the difference between a phylogenetically corrected analysis and a analysis of pure data points and give different results. And this difference is biologically interesting. I can comment upon that later. But overall, the co overall conclusion is that with the exception of, of damselflies in some circumstances, ordinates are larger at higher latitudes. Why is that so? Well, uh, to analyze this, we, we investigated how total body length, development time, and temperature are related. And we had to restrict this analysis to uh, ordinata from Europe, where we have the best data on development time and, and body length. Unfortunately, many, many other parts of the world, we don't have that, uh, that detailed data that we would like to. So we looked how, how the local te the, uh, temperature where a species was uh, uh, lived affect the development time and total body length uh, using uh, uh, phylogenetic path analysis. So we looked at both direct and indirect effect of temperature on total body length. And the best support we found was uh, what we call here model one, where temperature has high temperature uh, shortens development time. So it accelerates development time. And shorter development time in turn reduces body size. So temperature has an indirect effect on body size, an indirect negative effect on of, of body size in a warm area development times is shorter, and that leads to smaller uh, body size. And this is uh, uh, incorporating phylogenetic information. There appears to be no direct effect of temperature on body size, on the uh, adult body size. So uh, the main effect of temperature seems to be g going this indirect path through uh, accelerating development time. So clearly, temperature plays a role indirectly in affecting development time. However, temperature is not the only factor. And it's important to uh, keep in mind that the body size diversity uh, of an ordinate assembly at a given biogeographic lo location reflects not only local in situ evolution, but also uh, dispersal from other areas, in particular dispersal from the tropics, where most lineages actually evolved into the temperate zone at higher latitudes have played a, uh, an important role. And our phylogenetic analysis show or indicate that uh, larger body sizes seem to evolve uh, repeatedly at lower latitudes in the tropical zone, and such larger uh, lineages, once they have emerged, they tend to disperse into the temperate zone. Perhaps because larger body sizes associated with better flight ability, so larger uh, 
uh, lineages are better able to disperse out of the tropics. And this also holds that uh, it's logical if you think about a, at a general level, because the Anisoptera, the dragonflies, are generally larger and they are more uh, overrepresented relative to damselflies, which are smaller and poorer flyer in the temperate zone. The dra dragonflies with a larger body size and better flight ability have been better able to colonize northern areas. And this differential dispersal out of the tropics by larger lineages also contributes to explain this pattern of larger uh, lineages inhabiting northern regions and not only temperature. And another argument or another strong indication that temperature is not everything in explaining this latitudinal body size pattern and at the interspecific level is that if we look at the fossil data and break it down by wing length in relation to the latitude where the fossil was found and we move towards the present, we see something, a very interesting pattern. So in the upper graph, you see the latitudinal wing length gradient for Anisoptera, for dragonflies. And you see between 210 and 150 million years ago, it was negative. There were more, more large lineages in the tropics. Then as we approach the present, the slope becomes shallower and reverses sign and becomes even positive among extant uh, dragonflies. So obviously, if temperature was a main or only factor explaining this latitudinal size gradient, it could, can obviously not explain why it has changed over macroevolutionary time, shifting from being negative with small lineages in the north and large in the south, in the tropics, to becoming positive as it is today. If we look at damselflies, which have not as rich fossil record, we see a qualitatively similar trend steeply negative in the past, becoming more shallow and still slightly negative today. So clearly something interesting is going on. Why did this latitude body size relationship change over macroevolutionary time? We have argued based on some data we have been doing where we compiled uh, wing length variation of uh, dragonflies and damselflies across the globe with uh, and related it to four environmental variables, namely temperature, uh, precipitation, two climatic variables, tree cover and bird diversity, which capture uh, what we would call uh, more uh, proxies of predation risk. And uh, we tried to, because predation risk from birds then, so we, 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 have ar we argue that the emergence, the evolutionary emergence of birds and bird predation, possibly also competition from birds from 150 million years and onwards, might have driven large ordinates out of the tropics. And in support of this, this is an analysis of global variation in wing length in relation to these factors. When we incorporate this uh, information about these factors, the best model we find support for is one where temperature has a negative effect of explaining uh, um, wing length um, uh, uh, of, of um, or, or on on, uh, on these uh, species. As expected, you know, larger, higher temperature usually leads to smaller body size, body size, as we showed before. But if we look at avian diversity, species diversity of birds, which is our proxy for, for predation risk, it has about three times stronger effect than temperature. Uh, so we really think that this, our crude measure of, of predation risk, avian diversity, captures something of what we think is that uh, the presence of many species of birds leads to smaller automates, controlling for phylogeny and also controlling for spatial autocorrelation. This effect could have arisen simply because of diversity effect. So we did a fifth model, a fifth analysis complementary where we included uh, regional mam mammalian diversity. Mammals are not predators on 
on uh, automates to any ex large extent. And as you can see, there is there doesn't seem to be any uh, general diversity effect because there is no significant effect at all of mammal diversity, but the effect of bird diversity and, and temperature remain significant. So we really think that there was an important role for predation in explaining these uh, latitudinal um, size uh, relationships. And of course, this is a statistical analysis. It's correlational with all its uh, limitations. Uh, but just as a natural history anecdote uh, and the opportunity to show if, if some of my photos, here is the Brasilia, the Atlantic forest in Brazil in the Rio Grande uh, Forest Reserve, a fantastic place where I had the opportunity to do field work. And on my last day of the field work, I photographed this rufous tailed jacamar, which is a insect predator which uh, where it had taken a uh, um, captured a large dragonfly a darner of the family Ashnida. so there is good evidence that birds are predators on odonates and also some evidence that birds are size selective predators primarily hitting the large ones and we know then that as i said birds evolved emerged on the scene about 150 million years ago and then have diversified ever since. And so we really think that the evolutionary emergence of birds at the macroevolutionary level uh, have strongly affected um, size evolution in Odonata. But the roles might sometimes become reversed. Uh, here is a fantastic photo from Twitter. I've, I've forgotten the, the, the uh, photographer. I found this on Twitter. Um, but it shows uh, a, a, um, a dragonfly of the family Gonfide in North America. I think it's a dragon hunter who has attacked a hummingbird, a very small bird, and is consuming it. So there can be antagonistic relationships between odonates and, and birds, and they might sometimes be reversed, uh, as this picture shows. So after this, uh, I would turn my last part of my talk and uh, discuss some macroevolutionary and macroecological aspects of sexual selection in odonates. And I just start by showing this fossil from a Chinese research group, which uh, was subscribed a few years ago. Um, it's a fossil in, in Burmese amber, and uh, it got a lot of media attention, and you see the reason why it got this media attention is that the, this fossil damselfly had the males had these very flattened legs, flattened and striped legs, and the authors, particularly the hindwing legs, and the authors suggested that this was some kind of ornament under sexual selection uh, that was uh, um, a signaling trait. However, the authors forgot. And we should emphasize that there are extant damselflies which have very similar uh, flattened legs today. Here's one species from Thailand where the males have these remarkably flattened uh, legs that presumably is a secondary sexual character. And here are some photos from a, a field expedition I did to Cameroon in the uh, rainforest in Cameroon where we found this species which is very common, Copra congolensis, pro belongs to the same family as these previous ones. And you see the males have these very nice yellow flattened legs that are not so extremely flat as the others, but they are clearly glowing in yellow. And you find these uh, males sitting in the dark rainforest in sunspots exposing these yellow legs. So this is an interesting example how the trait that is doesn't serve sexual selection function originally have become co-opted uh, to become a secondary sexual character in this case the legs uh, that was more an anecdotal aspect of sexual selection uh, here i will show some data on on um, uh, uh, as an, from a study organism i've studied now for quite a long time and that's the common blue-tailed damselfly, Ischnura elegans, which is a wonderful insect, which is uh, characterized by three heritable 
female color morphs. Um, and these heritable female color morphs, um, it's, we know this color morph locus, it's a one locus a character, an autosomal locus with three alleles in a dominance hierarchy, uh, giving rise to three visible phenotypes, but six genotypes. Uh, one of the morphs, uh, the blue morph, is an androchrome or amorph, and it's considered to be a male mimic. These males look, these females look like males, and, and both in terms of color and body shape. And then there are two other female morphs which differ from the males, which are called I and O here for simplicity. And the dominance hierarchy means that that uh, uh, we only have three visible phenotypes, and these polymorphism is limited to females. They're not present in males. And the basic uh, uh, mechanism behind the maintenance of this polymorphism is uh, male mating harassment. So males have plastic search images. They try to mate with females. They develop a search image, uh, and their search image becomes affected on the local morph frequency. So they tend to develop a preference for morphs that are common, which leads to increased male mating harassment of the common morphs, and thereby negative frequency dependent selection and a um, rare morph advantage. So that's the basic uh, story behind the maintenance of this polymorphism. Uh, I have studied uh, several, a number of populations for 20 years now. Here are the first 10 years, they have about one generation a year. We go out every year and we quantify the color morph frequencies in these local populations and look at their stability and change over time. And as you can see here, they are remarkably stable over 10 years. Uh, the most common morph in, in Northern Europe, in Sweden, where we work, is the male mimic, which is about between 60 and 80 percent. But you can also see on this time uh, series, uh, particularly in the, in the uh, male, the blue lines, that there is also some fluctuations around the long-term overall frequency. So when, a, when the male mimic is common one year, they tend to drop the next year and so on. So if, if, as a matter of fact, if we analyze these time series, we find that these time series are more stable than expected from if it was a neutral polymorphism. There seems to be a pullback force, something that prevents any morph from going to fixation or being lost. And we interpret that as the, the, the pullback force of negative frequency dependent selection, maintaining these polymorphisms over time. And Something about the ontogeny of the color development of these morphs. They spend one year in the larvae as larval stage, sometimes two. Uh, they come up uh, as immatures, and then they go throughout a series of ontogenetic color changes until they become sexually mature. And in these early ontogenetic stages, all of them have a blue patch on the abdomen tip. And that patch uh, is also uh, the male have. And the androchrome female morph maintains this blue male-like trait, whereas the two other morphs cover it with pigment. So the the uh, you can say actually the androchrome female morph actually maintains a male-like um, uh, color pattern. Some almost you could call this a neotenic. Um, form of development. And that has some advantages in the sense that they are perceived as being males and in some circumstances receive less male mating harassment. Uh, we have just started looking at the genetics and genomic basis of this color polymorphism. And as I mentioned, it is uh, the color locus in itself is a, a one major uh, autosomal gene. But when we look at gene expression profiles of these female color morphs during the course of, of color development, as they, as they develop their final adult coloration, we see that a lot of different, different genes are differentially expressed 
between these morphs. So the color morph locus has many pleiotropic effects on many different uh, type, types of traits and different genetic pathways. And we have reason to believe, based on our own research and research in other labs, that the DMRT gene family, which contains the famous double sex gene, which is involved in, in sexual differentiation, is involved in this color polymorphism. So specifically, the male mimicking females might have hijacked the double sex system or the DMRT gene system and are uh, borrowing uh, male features to develop their uh, uh, final female phenotype. Uh, there is also uh, geographic clines in the frequency of these male mimicking females. As I said, they are more common at higher latitude up in northern Europe, where we work, whereas in southern Europe they are down to 20-30% frequency, as you see in the, the graph on the left. And in the middle you see a ternary plot, and the ternary plot uh, essentially show more frequency variation. Uh, uh, in different populations across Europe. And uh, you will notice from this ternary plot that there is, we haven't found a single population, a single monomorphic population where you only have one morph. Those would be the corners in this triangle. We have found a few cases or some cases of dimorphic populations with only two morphs. Those are on the edges. Uh, but mo the vast majority of all populations are trimorphic. They have all three morphs across Europe, but in various frequency. So in the purple points show the northern European uh, populations, and they are tend to be displaced towards having higher frequency of androchromes, uh, male mimics. And controlling for, for uh, uh, spatial uh, effects, there seem to be a negative effect on uh, temperature on the androchrome female frequencies. So they seem to be more common when temperature is low rather than when it's high. And uh, a similar pattern is found also in the Japanese Ishnura senegalensis, a species that occurs in Japan and also in India, where the southern populations, the southern warmer populations, have very low frequency of the andromorph females which increase in frequency as you move north towards colder areas. And uh, experiments we have been doing in large outdoor mesocosms also show that the androchrome females, they have a shorter color development time. They accelerate, they can reach sexual maturity faster than the other morphs, which presumably give them an advantage in cold environments and short summers. And they also seem there is a strong uh, effect on probability of reaching maturity, surviving to maturity, depending on the temperature these morphs uh, experience during color development, with the male mimics being uh, doing better at low temperatures and bad at high temperatures, and vice versa. So these biogeographic uh, analysis of a single species, as well as our experimental studies, uh, stimulate us to look, take a, a broader and uh, global macroevolutionary phylogenetic approach to understand the microevolutionary history of this color polymorphism. We have fairly good understanding of what, what factors maintain the polymorphism within a single species of Ishnura elegans. And Factors like temperature, which explains um, regional divergence in more frequencies. But we didn't know very much about what's the evolutionary history of this color polymorphism. So to study this, I worked with my former PhD student, uh, Beatrice Willink, in the upper left corner. She's currently working in the lecture in Costa Rica, in San Jose, in Central America, but will soon return to Sweden and Singapore, where she will start a postdoc working on the genomic basis of this color polymorphism. And during her PhD, we traveled to various places around the world to co collect phenotypic data from 
the family Cernagrinidae, pond damselflies, which is a large ordinate family within, uh, and Ischnura elegans is one of the species within this large family. And we have uh, produced a time calibrated phylogenetic tree for the superfamily Cernagrinoidea, uh, including a number of genera and species, about the third of all the, the, the species that occur. And we have used the total evidence approach where we combine, we use uh, paleogeographic information, current distributions, uh, information about current geographic distributions, and molecular information to time calibrate this phylogeny. So we have data on where these species occur, where current species occur, and we have a, a model of molecular uh, evolution. And we incorporate, co combine this information uh, to, uh, here, here are, for instance, the, the different geographic zones of the world that we defined. Um, and, and then, as you know, there has also been uh, continents have moved plate tectonic uh, due to plate tectonics. So we can reconstruct our potential dispersal pathways. Uh, to infer the evolutionary history and timing of dispersal between different continents and so on, incorporating all molecular, biogeographic, and paleogeographic data. And to make a long story short here, I can't, will not go into detail. Uh, our data indicates that this family is about 70 million years old, which is in the ballpark or near the, the, the fossil amber amber fossil I showed before, which is estimated to be 100 million years old. And that belongs to a, a family, uh, Platycnemida, that's closely related or sometimes grouped with this in this um, Cernagronoidea superfamily. And then we use this phylogeny to test the number of phylogenetic hypotheses for the origin of female color polymorphism. And we we uh, connect, we were specifically interested in two factors, the openness of a habitat and the pos latitudinal position where a, a species occurs. And we argue that these two factors are very important in terms of the dynamics of sexual conflict, specifically open habitats, uh, such as ponds in open habitats would be quite isolated, they would be highly productive due to uh, sun energy, that would lead to high population density, male bias sex ratio, high male encounter rate and non-territorial behavior, increasing conflict over mating, that would drive the evolution origin of female morphs. Uh, uh, whereas closed habitats like forests, one could imagine that females are more better able to escape male har harassment and sexual conflict would be reduced. And we all also argue that high latitudes, there are short breeding seasons, short explosive breeding seasons in the temperate zone that would also lead to higher sex ratio, density, high male encounter rate, and non-territorial behavior and increased sexual conflict. And uh, would also stimulate the origin of female morphs. The first we looked at this first, we found across our entire phylogeny, uh, interestingly, there are multiple gains and losses of female color polymorphism. We also find that female, uh, uh, the ancestral state, the predicted ancestral state within this superfamily was a monomorphic ancestor where females look different from males, heterochrome females. Uh, and then Female polymorphism with male mimicking females or male like females have evolved uh, several different times and sometimes have been lost. And this is also true if we zoom in not specifically on the genus Ishnura, where Ishnura elegans occur, the ancestor was predicted to be a, a female monomorphic of only one female type and they look different from females. And then there are at least two independent gains of female polymorphism with two females and if a male mimicking female appeared, and then one case of three female morphs 
and that's within the clade that contains Ishnura elegans. Uh, so this essentially provides some support to the mimicry hypothesis because we can show that the male mimicking female type is derived, not ancestral. And that's crucial for the mimicry hypothesis because if it would have turned out that male-like females were ancestral, the mimicry hypothesis would have fallen apart, but they appear, appear to be derived. And there are then several micro and macroevolutionary gains and losses of the polymorphism. To the left, you see, for instance, the, the Ishnura elegans, different populations where diverging morph frequencies, sometimes losing one of the morphs, although not all morphs. And to the right, on the, from our phylogenetic data, we can look, estimate the gain and losses of polymorphism depending on the ancestor. So it's a very dynamic system with gains and losses of polymorphism through the his evolutionary history. Uh, looking also at the polymorphic lineages and the monomorphic lineages, we find evidence that the polymorphic lineages tend to disperse to and stay in temperate areas. They don't necessarily evolve at a higher rate in the temperate areas, but they tend to disperse and are better colonizers and stay in these temperate areas. And here it's split up on three different clades. And polymorphism is green, as you see here. Uh, monomorphic is yellow. You note that the third clade, which contains this, this uh, feather legs, uh, they have never evolved. Any, there's not a, a single known case where they have evolved the polymorphism which we think might be because they are often inhabiting forest streams, particularly in the tropical region where sexual conflict is less intense. We also find that there is a, a, a link between open landscapes as predicted uh, and polymorphism. So polymorphic lineages are more open, more common in open landscape and ponds. Uh, where we predicted sexual conflict to be stronger, also in accordance with our theory. Uh, so our, our data indicates that they emerge at higher evolution rate in this open landscape, but they also tend to differentially disperse into these open landscapes, presumably because monomorphic lineages might go extinct at a higher rate in these open landscapes because of the intense sexual conflict um, reduces female fitness. And finally, here are some field data where we have made transects uh, in various areas in the world, in the tropical zone and in the temperate zone, uh, and classified the habitat as closed, typically forest or open, and look at the probability of female polymorphism. And these surveys clearly show that open habitats, it's more common with polymorphic uh, species, uh, taking phylogeny into account. And to the right-hand graph, right-hand figure, you see the probability of a species being in the uh, female, uh, um, various female color states, and the probability of a lineage being uh, polymorphic increases uh, significantly with density. So the more dense populations are, according to these transects, the more higher probability that the female the species is polymorphic. So to sum up this, uh, linking micro and macro evolution is a major challenge. I argue, I would argue we need multiple and complementary approaches, and we need a greater diversity of study organisms. I hope I've convinced you that ordinates can help to bridge micro and macro evolution. I hope my Indian colleagues uh, take this to their heart, that ordinates are excellent study system for these questions, particularly micro and macro evolution and dynamics of sexual conflict. And I know there is a lot of interesting work going on in India on ordinates. Uh, uh, I hope you take this to your heart. We need more research on female color signaling, and I would argue that female sexual polymorphisms are quite underappreciated in evolutionary biology. And with this, I'd like to thank my funding agencies and uh, 
PhD students and postdocs, past and present, and I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Svensson. Uh, this is an incredible, incredibly huge amount of work. Uh, there are a few questions. Uh, so first, there is a comment from Amitabh Joshi. If natural yeah. populations of order nates are not strictly discrete generation systems, then faster development could well confer a fitness advantage to offset greater adult size, even independently of predation risk. Let's see if I understand the question. The, 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 they are not strictly discrete always. That's correct. And his the question was whether whether the faster development would would uh, would confer an advantage. Confer, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that 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 seems. Um, um, I mean, I think that's in line. What I I hope it was in line with what I said. I I think the 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 predation the faster development time is clearly is is I mean, with high predation risk, all else being equal, of course, like we know in guppies, for instance, it's it's. Uh, um, with high predation, we would select for for shorter development time. Yes. So I think the point was it would confer a fitness advantage even independent risk. Oh, even in oh, okay, I see, oh. I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, yeah that's that's uh, that's true for sure. I mean, it's I I should say I'm quite agnostic to the cost of of. Of long development time. I mean, I, there could be other costs of long development time, <laughs> including that you are outcompeted by a faster developer. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with that. But it's, we still need to explain why there are some species which are quite big and spend several years in the larval stage. Uh, Pravi Sena has a question uh, about what the core, the timeline of sexual maturation uh, with body size. Yeah, so it's important to uh, realize that they don't grow in size after they have come up of the water. So the sexual maturation period, uh, they don't grow in structural size. They are the same, the final size when they come out of the water. However, they can fatten up and and forage and get they get heavier, so to say, right? They 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 when they come out of the water, they are very soft, and they typically go away from the water and into the forest and eat more, and their wings harden, and they gain weight. That's been shown in dragonflies, but they don't get structurally larger. They are the same. They can only change their their energy reserves, so to say. Shambhud has a question. Has the temperature latitude relationship remained consistent over geological time? Not also intercept. You know, the relationship between temperature and latitude. Temperature, yeah. To my understanding, over the period we are talking of, this is a very important question, of course. Um, I, 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 I confess I'm not a a, a, a uh, geologist. I wonder how good the data is. If if like I mean I would say qualitatively warmer in the tropics. Yes, over the period. Uh, quantitatively, mm -hmm. if the 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 temperature latitude relationship has changed, I actually have to say confess I don't know, and I'm not even sure mm -hmm. we have that good data. I have to ask a geologist. But an excellent question. Another question uh, from Prabhi Sinha. Does competition reversal in body size of damsel in the two extreme latitudes? Did they early in evolution uh, or did they drive, I think, early in evolution due to differences in time of sexual maturation? That's, that's a brilliant question, I think, because I, if I understand it correctly, it's whether uh, whether the the competition between different 
different odonates, say dragonflies, which are bigger and typically predator on damselflies, uh, had a role. Uh, it, it's definitely important. We know dragonflies are predators on damselflies, but it's, it's unlikely to explain the pattern we have seen where dragonflies, the predators in this case, are leaving the tropics. They were hardly, they were not driven out by the da smaller damselflies, most likely. It would, one would have expected another pattern then, so that the damselflies would disperse out of the tropics, which are the victims. Mm -hmm. um, Amitabh Joshi has another question. Do the oh. types of the female moth locus have any known phenotypic effect at all on males? Again, I'm, I'm impressed by so many smart questions. Uh, the answer is we would like to know, we don't know. So we, ha we, ha we haven't reached the stage where we can genotype uh, them. Obviously, that would be very interesting, right? So the, 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 when we have characterized the morph locus sufficiently, we would like to go out in nature and sequence the putatively monomorphic males and see, for instance, their effect if mating success is affected, for instance. Uh, so we don't know. My guess is, or we have some indication that the maternal color morphs affects the development time of both male and female offspring. So there are some phenotypic effects of the maternal morphs on the males. Uh, I would predict that in the future, if we can, are able to genotype them, I think there might be effects. We know, for instance, that males vary slightly in color from blue to green, and that could be because of incomplete sex limitation. That's clearly something we would like to follow up with better tools and techniques. So uh, why has evolved in that particular species and not in others in that lineage? Do you have any ecological correlations? Uh, yeah, I mean, the best ecological correlations, why, you, you mean in the superfamily as a whole or in certain species within the superfamily? Yeah. Because in the, yeah. in the, in the, in the superfamily as a whole, it's quite common. It's actually mm -hmm. uh, not a majority of species, but quite many. And there, the factors we identified are uh, density and habitat openness. Uh, yeah. Across other, uh, in a broader perspective, we know that these male mimics occur also in other damselfly families and even among dragonflies. As a mm -hmm. matter of fact, my Indian colleagues actually described recently some dragonflies where they, they have male mimics. So they occur. My suspicion is that they are more common also in other animal groups outside. Mm -hmm by damselflies. Uh, I know, for instance, there's a PhD student in Cornell who works on male-like uh, female hummingbirds. Thank you, sir. But even uh, I, we are extremely excited to know that you are, you are getting us to know about even the unpublished results. Great. Uh, we, there, there's one thing that we all, I particularly enjoyed to see that uh, People, the, the data it took go to the print you know, shared with us. Thank you very much, sir. And secondly, the, we work, I work with Rusophila. In Rusophila, males are more polymorphic, morphologically polymorphic than females. Mm. Oh, so males are more variable in Drosophila. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That is very interesting. But I also know, I'm not the Drosophila expert, but I know that. In Melanogaster, yeah. I think, I've seen them myself, and I also know some other species of Drosophila. There are also females which are male-like, females who have mm -hmm. uh, the dark abdomen patch, just yeah. like males. Uh, yeah. I think there are a couple of published papers on these, on the genetics, but no, no systematic study of these male-like females. No, I think maybe. some some of you Drosophila experts should consider doing that. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wings, wing polymorphism is 
particularly with the color bands and the wings, etc. Where females lack such things. And also the body size variation is too much in, among males when compared to the females. But the, the, the body size better variation in uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I think there are no more. So I'd like to thank Professor Swenson for such a fascinating talk. And we hope you can visit India sometime after COVID. Thank Thanks you so much. much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.